me welcome His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, Shah Mahmood Qureshi Sahib. So we have had this conference over the last two days in which we had four sessions and nine foreign speakers and the rest local participants. It covered the subjects of the global order, the emerging technology debate, the nature of future warfare, and finally, the, uh, the last one was forced posturing. So uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, congratulate all the foreign speakers that have come here, despite all the uh, risks, et cetera, that have been floating around in all the countries in the form of coronavirus. Uh, we are glad that all of them made it, and uh, they made significant contribution in the success of this seminar or conference, whatever we call. For the uh, benefit of those people who were not present yesterday, uh, I would briefly summarize the major takeaways uh, from the sessions that we had yesterday. And of course, subsequently, the, uh, I will cover up the sessions that uh, we had today. So, hmm? okay. The day's first speaker was our eminent uh, Ambassador Cameron Munter from the United States. Uh, to start off with, he highlighted three main problems and challenges for the emerging world order. And these were climate change, technological revolution, domestic problems of governance in Pakistan and elsewhere. According to him, the old world order seems to be failing, but the new system has not yet taken shape. And that, of course, leaves ambiguities. To benefit from these transformations, Pakistan should break institutional reforms and improve the way of its governance. Pakistan also uh, needs to focus on high-end technologies, develop innovative solutions for the emerging problems, rather than focusing on small concessions or only relying on textile industry. Acknowledging the embarrassing silence on the Kashmir issue by the West, the ambassador also drew our attention to Pakistan's inability to raise voice on the issue of Muslim Uyghurs in China. This was followed by a presentation by Ambassador Inamul Haq, who in his remarks stated that states are building strategic alliances and new weapon systems to maintain their dominant position in the world. The US is responding to China's rise by following a containment policy. Efforts are being made to portray Chinese assistance as a debt trap, whereas in his opinion, it is the Western powers that have created the debt trap for the world. On India, he was of the view that Modi's internal and external policies are bringing the region to the brink of war world must not follow the policy of appeasement for their short-term political and commercial gains. This was followed by Ambassador Jilani. Jalid Abbas Jilani in his remarks stated that despite acute differences between China and Russia, uh, between US, China, and Russia, they will continue to compete and confront each other at the same time. He suggested that some measures for Pakistan's future strategy, and these were Number one, it is in the interest of both the US and Pakistan to maintain good relations. And these relations should maintain independent of Pakistan-China relations. Pakistan must capitalize on new opportunities to upgrade its relations with Russia. On Afghanistan, despite the hurdles and India's efforts to create instability, Pakistan must continue to work towards Afghan stability. With India, peaceful coexistence is only possible if India revokes its earlier decision of abrogating Article 370 and works constructively towards normalization of relations with Pakistan. 
Then we go to the second session of uh, emergent technology debate. In his uh, keynote speech, Sir Brian Burridge uh, explained challenges of new technologies, including artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, etc. According to him, with artificial intelligence, operations in gray zone become more practical and real. Therefore, we need to look at the future of warfare and how to set rules for the likely employment of new technologies. Answering the question of AI as a force multiplier, he indicated that we needed to understand that it is only the human mind to detect where to place the cursor in this kind of warfare. This was followed by Group Captain Holt from Australia, who talked about the emergent technologies through the lens of national security and mentioned the top 10 technology trends of 2020. According to him, information and ICT are essential and every organization is a tech company and every employee is a technologist. Dr. Neri from Italy talked about the weapons of the future, including hypersonic weapons, laser guns, high power microwaves, and stealth fighters. According to him, the gap between technologically advanced and technology dependent countries is narrowing, which has increased the risks of war. It is therefore important to reform the United Nations to make it more empowering and effective so that it can play its desired role in preventing wars. Dr. Olsen from uh, Norway gave a very good talk about the future of air power and emphasized on the importance of cyber, AI, and space domains. He was of the view that to deal with the future challenges, we need warrior scholars who think differently and appreciate air power. Then we come to the uh, first session of this morning. Uh, AVM Fires spoke on the role of airspace power in South Asia and highlighted future challenges which include weaponization of space and cyber warfare. According to him, India is seeking primacy in shaping the new world order through military modernization and its ambitious space plan. Pakistan controls India's silk route that could connect it with Central Asia. He also indicated that India wants a ring of security around itself, but due to its inherent vulnerabilities, it finds itself in rings of vulnerabilities, both internally and externally. Referring to last year's surgical strike, AVM-5 is of the view that air power has now become a weapon of choice in achieving political objectives. According to him, the future threats will not come from weapons of mass destruction, but from cyber attacks. This was followed by Lieutenant General Amir Riaz, who in his remarks stated that hybrid war has posed a dilemma and made war more complex, blurring lines between military and non-military means. According to him, we have reached a point where man's imagination and technological developments are complementing each other and principles of combat are under great stress, thus making it imperative to rewrite the rules of war. Main target of hybrid warfare is to target political consensus. If not calibrated, it could have intended and unintended consequences and could become autonomous with the involvement of many actors. For Pakistan to fight a hybrid war, we must have political consensus. Build alliances and make efforts to convert US-China competition into collaboration. This was followed by Mr. George Sebastio, who in his talk on cyber warfare mentioned that in order to defend yourself, you would need to clearly understand the dynamics of hybrid warfare. The share of cyber attacks may be small, but their impact is immense. The objective of the state sponsors cyber attacks, which have increased dramatically in the past few years, is very different from private ones. That is to disrupt the fabric of the target country. Next, we come to the uh, second session of today. The speakers are right in front of you. Uh, Jan Janjua was the keynote speaker in his remark. He stated that countries comprising 
the Muslim bloc have maximum resources. To capitalize on this, Pakistan has to rise beyond CPEC and reach out to Africa. The future of the world lies in Afro-Asia, with Pakistan as a pivot and potential to become massive hub of trade. Pakistan is over-relying on its nuclear deterrence. That is a point that he made very clearly. He also said that we have to change our attitude, improve governance to deal with the challenges of hybrid war. This was followed by General, uh, and of course, I, he made a very important point, which is missed out over here, uh, which he, some of you heard after you arrived, and that was that there has to be a uh, seamless offensive defense, you know, that there is no uh, limited war. Either it is no war, or it is total war. So that is the point that he uh, emphasized upon. He was followed by General Steininger. Uh, who discussed the forced posturing for industrially independent and dependent countries. According to him, forced post force posturing revolves around three parameters. Uh, strategic stature of the country, level of strategic ambition, and inspirations and objectives of the policies of the state. With the exception of superpowers, he pointed out, strong force posturing is challenging for all states due to enhanced globalization and one strategy of force posturing does not apply to all countries. He also made that point uh, linked to the uh, dependence of uh, you know, less developed countries. That is because of the hurdles that are created by non-availability of uh, technology or other political consideration which uh, uh, stop or uh, hinder the transfer of uh, weapon sales, etc. He proposed that alliances such as NATO as a response towards strong force posturing from hostile countries. For weaker countries, if we can form alliances, uh, we can perhaps defend ourselves better. Uh, this was followed by Commodore Edward Simon, who discussed UK's military flying system. According to him, we needed to craft methods of learning that suits next generation of officers as per their learning abilities and prepare them for the next generation of aircraft, such as uh, the F-35. The point being made was that so far we have been reliant on uh, various type of aeroplanes, trainers that we have, and we have tried to uh, adjust our training programs with respect to those steps there are in the training system. But his emphasis was to put the man in the center and to see how he responds to inputs uh, that are made and that uh, he's subjected to. Uh, this was followed by uh, A. Marshal Javed, uh, who uh, talked about the post Balakot uh, uh, situation. And while discussing the role of the PF in sustaining deterrence, stated that before India's surgical strike at Balakot, CAS had analyzed the security environment and had predicted a similar action. Uh, Pakistan's national leadership took a firm stance following Balakot, which was supported by the people as well. PF has sustained deterrence with Operation Swift Retort against Indian aggression and future posture would be responsive and aggressive. Under the given circumstances, aggressive posturing is a compulsion of Pakistan. He also made a point that with India's current policies against Muslims in Kashmir and in India, there is a possibility of uh, further breakup of India. Uh, and he coined the term of 1947 part two. India is spending $300 billion towards uh, military modernization in the coming years, but this can lead to an arms race in the region, which is really quite unnecessary. I wish to, uh, in the end, uh, thank all the speakers, all the delegates who came from far off distances to attend this conference. And I'm glad, as a host, to see that on the fourth session of the second day of the conference, the entire hall is still full. Uh, I appreciate your, in your interest. Uh, it uh, provided, probably indicates that we collected a good uh, group of speakers and our uh, topics that we suggested were interesting so that we could hold your attention. I, I want to 
uh, also thank all present, all connected with the holding of this uh, conference, uh, especially my colleagues at CAS, because it was a huge project uh, that we started some months ago. And uh, 